I'm Chris. This is Cindy, and we are 319 Reptiles. We're here to talk to you about five mistakes you're potentially making with your ball python. Now that intro may seem a little dramatic, but I'm gonna give you the information to make sure that you're able to keep your ball python safe and healthy. These animals are our pets, and that's something we are responsible for as their keepers. So let's get into it. Number one, temperature. Now temperature is probably the most important to helping these animals thrive, keeping them safe. And to control temperatures in your enclosures, you're gonna wanna make sure you have a thermostat controlling the heat source on your enclosure. This could be a few different types. They've got these here for as low as $20 on Amazon, and they're very simple to work. They have three buttons. They got one button that sets the temperature, two that move the temperature up, or the temperature down, and that's about it. And you place your probe uh, near your heat source. For us, we place it either directly under or directly above, depending on what type of enclosure. If you'd like to see a video on that, we can put up some shorts on that or we can do a long form video too, showing how to set it up on different enclosures with different heat sources even. So, but you wanna make sure that that probe that controls the temperature is telling that thermostat what the temperature is, is in a place where your snake or, or lizard or any kind of reptile cannot move it. It's, we've had it in the past where I've tried to silicone it into the bottom of a glass enclosure and I'll have a burrowing snake or even a ball python who's a larger, a little bit larger bodied snake and they can work that probe free from that silicone and knock it off. And at that point that heat pad's gonna just shoot up. Now if you do not use a thermostat, I've seen some horrific videos of snakes being burned. Um, heat rocks do not use them they're garbage not even with a heat thermostat i would use those we prefer underbelly heat it helps these guys digest their food as you know they're cold blooded so they use their outside environment to get the heat they need to metabolize their food otherwise it would just sit in their stomachs and cause them to be ill one heat source we do not recommend is the red lights the heat lights they are typically left on all night. It stresses your snake out. Your snake should have a day-night heat cycle, or day-night light cycle, sorry. So instead of those, I would use a ceramic heat emitter or some kind of non-lighting heat emitter if you are gonna go with that overhead light or a radiant heat panel. We use radiant heat panels in our PVC cages. We just screw them to the top. But as I said, we most, Times, if we can we use that underbelly heat I do recommend if you are going to use over the top put a ceramic tile underneath so they have a hot spot and they can lay on that it's they good for that metabolism or after they eat be able to go somewhere to get that heat one other type of thermostat is a pulse proportional there's a few different brands out there and mind you none of the things I'm going to show you today were sponsored for or by these companies. These are just products we use. We use the VE100 here on our incubator and on the racks you see behind me. They do a great job of keeping temperature. They will heat your temp, your heat source up to the temp you set it for and then just pulse electricity to it to keep that temperature so you don't see any spikes or drops. And they do a really good job. We use it on this incubator here and it's got a circulated airflow and it keeps it right at 88 degrees all the time. Now with those other on offs like the one I showed you earlier, those are going to see a bit more of a uh, fluctuation in temperature, probably like three to five degrees from what I've seen. And those essentially are going to get your heat source up to temp, turn it off. And then when it starts to drop and it drops a degree below, Sometimes it's a degree, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five. I've heard with age they get a little bit more fluctuation too, but that's nothing that we've seen. But they work great for just underbelly heat or overhead heat. 
it's for incubating. I would not recommend using the on off. Go with the pulse proportional, spend the extra money. These VEs 100s, we got our VE 200s are what we're using. The VE 200s, I think they're like 120 bucks. And you might be able to even get them cheap, cheaper at your local reptile expo or pet shop. Do your research on it. Choose what works best for you. You don't want to burn your snake. Another thing you're going to want to have is this heat gun. And this will essentially tell you your temperature. It's got a little laser on it. I don't know if you can see it behind me on the incubator. But it will tell you the temperature wherever you point it. Click, let go, and it tells you the temp. Another great tool to have, especially if you're keeping multiple snakes so you don't have to have multiple thermometers. You can go in and check different spots of the enclosure and just move this guy around. The number two mistake we see people making is humidity levels. Now you want to have at least, at least 50% humidity for these guys. They typically in the wild are burrowing underground and it's very humid in these Burrows. They live in rodents' nests and termite nests, so that humidity is typically 50 to 90 percent. So that's the range you're going to want to be in. Now you don't want it too wet where they're laying because they could get scale rot. That that water, that moisture laying on it constantly can give them scale rot. So there's a few different things you can try. We use a garden sprayer type where you pump it up. Pull this trigger on the wand and spray it. This works really well because we're doing this for 40 snakes here. But on a smaller level, before we had this many, we were using these here. They work just fine. There are automatic misters. Oops, Cindy's trying to run away. As I was saying, there are automatic misters that you can set and they will spray for as long as you want is for many times a day as you set it for. I've not used one of these personally, but I've heard great things about them and wouldn't mind getting these in the future for some of our four x two PVC enclosures. I know the Monsoon, I don't remember which company makes it, but they make a multi enclosure one where you can hook up multiple enclosures to the same unit. Now another thing we have used in the past, they call them foggers, it's essentially a humidifier with a tube coming out of the top. You pipe the tube into your enclosure, you set it similar to those misting systems I was telling you about, you set how many times a day you want it to run and for how long, and it will put mist into the air, fog into the air essentially, it's a humidifier blowing through a tube as I said. Now I've heard these don't work as good to maintain humidity, they're going to kind of dissipate as soon as they shut off but they do make for a cool scene we did a short with Ray and I'll post it here for humidity also you're gonna want to use something that tells you what your humidity is now they we use these here but they do make handheld similar to the heat gun you were I was showing you earlier where you could stick that the tip of that gun into a location, pull the trigger, and it will tell you that humidity readout. So these are items you can have to monitor your humidity. What we do is we miss daily with that garden sprayer I showed you, and then we also have a humidifier in our reptile room to try to keep it at at least 50% in here. Number three, enrichment. This is uh, one that gets overlooked. Some people will want to put these guys in tubs in a rack and just set them in there with some substrate and a water bowl and that's their life. Now if that's how you treat your animal you're gonna get a pet rock which is a complaint I hear sometimes about ball pythons that they're just pet rocks but if you give these guys some enrichment they will utilize it they are curious animals they will investigate it and what we like to do is use cork rounds like this. You're going to want to make sure it's appropriate size so they can't get stuck in there. Otherwise, you're going to have to break it open and get them out potentially. Or these cork flats. These also help them, give them that texture to help them start shedding when they do go into shed. So that it serves a dual purpose. Multiple hides. We use these hides. They're fairly cheap. But we'll change it out. We'll give them a hide here and there. We'll change the size of it. Um, 
move it around their enclosure or their tub and just so they have something that's something that's new that they are curious and they can explore keeps their mind working it's good to change it up every now and then depending on what you're using they when you go to clean it out maybe that's the time to change things up you know move stuff from the left side to the right side from the cool side to the hot side it'll make them feel like they're moving into a new home but it'll, they'll still have their smell on things so that they feel safe and comfortable but it'll give them a new environment to explore keeps as i said earlier keeps the mind working we like to use garbage i guess you'd say sometimes where you throw in after you finish up with paper towels with some smaller snakes throw in this cardboard core and that works great too because you can throw it away after it's done or they're done with it when you go to clean it's not something you have to worry about sanitizing and it's recycling garbage and then you can recycle it when you're done we've also used boxes if you've got small boxes that uh I mean, you want to make sure it's not going to give them a paper cut or anything, sharp edges, but put those in there, let them explore in it, let them hide in it a little bit. Gives them something new get to explore and play around with. Number four, handling. So, especially with a new hatchling ball python you've, you're bringing home, they may be a little defensive and nippy. They're not mean, they're not looking to bite you, they don't want to eat you, they're scared and that's it they don't know your scent they don't know you you're this giant creature coming over them grabbing them similar to what their predators do in the wild so they are going to do what they need to what they believe is defending themselves which is strike at you and most times if you notice they strike and they don't hold on if they are to bite you and hold on to you they're just bringing themselves closer to you and you're a giant animal that's going to just either eat them or kill them. So they do not want to do that. The best thing you can do is handle them daily. We have the kids go through and handle ours all the time. They are, as you can see, Cindy's a sweetheart here. She's very curious, always been a very active ball python. And she loves being handled, being taken out of her cage and just exploring a new environment. It's something you can do each day. And I know it might be a little scary. It might be good to have a snake hook. So you can take a snake hook, tap your snake on the side if they're in a defensive strike pose, which you can see here. This will learn behavior too. If you do this every time you handle them, it's a good way to get them out of the feeding mode if they are in that feeding mode where they think they're getting food. Tap them on the side and they say, okay, I'm." I'm not getting fed right now. This must be to be handled. Now, if you've got a stubborn snake who just doesn't like to get held, we've got some adults that we we have we we received as adults. Now we have some ball pythons that we received as adults, and we weren't able to hold them frequently during their hatchling phase or yearling phase, and they are not too fond of being held. What we do with them is we'll go in, we'll do any kind of contact we can with them that's positive and shows them that we're not going to hurt them, we're not here to harm them. Usually we'll go in, maybe rub them for a few seconds, let them get our scent, and then end it for as long as they are comfortable with it. If you go for too long, they may strike at you and they may get stressed out and feel that that's their only way out of the situation they're in. But if you do this over time, they learn your scent, they learn that you're not going to harm them and they will settle down. They will better tolerate being handled. Number five, feeding. It's gotta be the number one thing I see out there is my ball python won't eat or my ball python went off food. Now, sometimes this is normal. If it's breeding season, usually November through March, your ball python may go off of food because that's just how they're wired during breeding season. We've got our males and females that are breeding behind us. They have not eaten in probably a month now. And we monitor that by taking their weights every week and making sure they're not losing weight. 
as long if your bike ball python goes off food for a few months and is not losing weight it's probably okay just be patient with them don't offer food too often otherwise they'll associate rejecting that I'd start with going with smaller food and try different things now we prefer feeding frozen thawed here but there are snakes sometimes where we have to feed them live to get them back on food uh, a lot of hatchlings they will not eat a frozen thawed mouse from our experience so we've had to give them a live usually hopper mouse out of the egg that doesn't mean they're going to be on live forever and you can't change them over to frozen thawed oh sorry sweetie it's okay it's okay she got a little head shy there um but you can still convert them over to frozen thawed prey it's just a matter of working them and weaning them over slowly to the prey item that you want to feed them we've had also snakes that will only eat mice and we've successfully been able to feed them mice you get them in a routine of eating every week and then maybe you drop a mouse in there smaller than they're normally eating and then afterwards you offer them a rat immediately and they'll take it and you can usually switch them over to rats rats are typically what you want to get them going on because that's when they get to a larger size like you see cindy here the you're going to have to feed multiple mice it's going to get expensive and typically they'll only take two maybe three of the smaller items and it's not going to equate to typically what they need to keep growing and stay healthy so I recommend getting them over to rats. Now if you are feeding frozen thawed, one mistake I see people make is not warming the food up enough. Now don't put it in the microwave, you're going to have a mess on your hands. And if you are going to use a heat lamp to warm the food, make sure you monitor it and don't forget about it or you're going to have a mess on your hands. And it's not fun to clean and smells. What we typically do is put them in a plastic Ziploc bag in the refrigerator overnight. This allows them to thaw and not get too warm to where you'll start getting bacteria growth inside the mouse. And then after that, we'll take that same bag, put it in as hot a water as we can get out of the tap. And what the idea is, is to get the mouse or the rat or prey item, whatever you're feeding, between 90 and 110 degrees. Now we have some ball pythons that I don't know that it, it matters much to them. They're such good eaters, they'll take it no matter what. But we have others that are picky, and typically the warmer you go with that, the more likely they are to take it. Uh, if you were to gun a live mouse, it'd be somewhere around like 92 degrees on the surface. And they're looking for that. They got the heat pits on their nose. So they're looking for that heat signature along with that movement. And to go with that, you've got your mouse warmed. If it's frozen thawed, you're going to want to make that mouse move a little so they believe it's alive and they are hunting. Some snakes will not eat it if it's not moving. I've got other snakes that if I warm it up, leave it in the bin overnight, I'll come back in the morning and that mouse will be gone or that rodent will be gone. They'll eat it no matter what. But a vast majority of them like that, that movement so they believe that they're hunting their prey. Hi, this is Audrey. One thing my dad forgot to tell you is never leave your snakes unattended with live mice in the cage. We've seen horrible pictures of snakes being bitten and eaten alive. Please don't, do not forget to take out the rodent before you leave the room. Those are the five mistakes we see people making when they're new to keeping ball pythons. If you disagree with anything, think we could do a better job, let us know down below. Also, let us know what you'd like to see in the future if you're a ball python keeper yourself. Thanks. Bye. See you on the next one. I love the chase and the hunt, and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want, and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted. Ah, she's got my arm. <laughs>